welcome to this episode of the Women and Money podcast. Um, today I'm joined by Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi, Michelle. And I'm joined by Jennifer. So, Jennifer, you are new to our team. You have joined the sofa. It's nice to be here. So, thanks for asking. So, just to put you on the spot, just to start with, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Jennifer O'Neill. I'm director of Athena Mortgages. And what we tend to do is we get our clients into their dream homes and then we work with them over the years to get them closer to mortgage freedom or mortgage comfort. And our whole aim is to educate and take the worry away so we can get them closer to financial freedom without them having to live off beans and toast. Loving that idea. And fabulous to have you on the team because I know mortgages is something that is not all of our strong points, to be fair. So you come in and you you can help guide us all along with that. So no, it's really lovely to have you here on the sofa. And you're going to join us today with a discussion that's not about mortgages, sorry. So this one is about we're doing it by the decades. So if I just give you a little bit of explanation. So whilst doing some searching on social media, on Pinterest, I found a, is it an infographic? Is that the right word? I believe they're called infographics, yes which is called Doing It By The Decade Financial Goals, which spell out what you should be doing in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s with regards to your financial planning. So I sent this out to Julie and we thought this would make quite a good subject for a podcast. So Julie, your initial thoughts before I say anything else? Well, I'm wondering what happens to everybody in the 70s and 80s, but, you know, what the heck? Now, i got to be honest, okay, so we... If we can, we'll put a link in the show notes to what it is that we're looking at. And I started working my way through and I thought, I am finding that a little bit so destroying. Well, no, I'm OK because I'm in my 40s. And what I was saying to Jennifer and Michelle before we started pressing record, my take on this, having seen the list is that in your 20s and 30s, you're not doing any of this stuff. Then when you hit 42, you're like, shit, I haven't done any of that stuff. At 43, you're like, oh, I still haven't done it. 44, you do one thing. 45, you try and do all of it. So as we're working through this and you're listening, if you're sitting there going, oh God, I haven't done that. See, if you're under 45, it's fine. You're normal. (laughs) If you're over 45, then maybe pick up the phone to me because I'm 48. I'll talk you down off the ledge. And as I'm 45, I'm obviously at that crisis point, so we'll be phoning you later, Julie. <laughs> Just getting a pass. I'll, I'll go to the pub for that. I think we'd like to join you. This kind of made me think, really, I think, not necessarily the words on that infographic in particular, but I think as we get older, making good financial choices is a really valuable skill to have. So I think it comes down to education and everything else. But as we know, our priorities do change as we get older. But the guiding principle, I think, with all of this is that we have to balance the short term needs with the long term goal. So I think if we kind of do it in that vein and going through the ages, that might help us a bit more than just following some of the specific information that we have listed on our infographic. (laughs) I like that word. (laughs) Have you not heard that before? No. (laughs) I was having a moment earlier talking to Jennifer. I couldn't remember it. It's like, is it an infogram? That would be the audio version. So in terms of the infographic, it starts in your 20s, but you know, we, we have a little bit before that. So when I was sort of thinking about this earlier, I did sort of think, obviously, we have some things, children and teenagers, which are important. And I just want to see whether we sort of put that out there because for children, you know, it is more guided by us. You know, we're obviously helping them. So I thought the first one I sort of start off with 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 pocket money, I suppose. Mm. Children. So that would be their their sort of decade of what they're doing and and maybe a first bank account. What do you think? I think that's really important because do you know one of the things that I'm really mindful of? So I've got an eleven year old. He'll be twelve, but maybe by the time this goes out. And what It's not just about managing the money and spending the money. One of the things I wanted him to learn was to make a decision for him to be in control of the money and for him to be in control of the decision. Because I'll be honest, along the way, there's been some regrets. It's normally been around roadblocks. 
So this is a game that they get on their tablets. And Roblox can be notorious for taking your money and giving you a thing that doesn't work very well. So he's, he's experienced buyer's remorse quite early in his life. <laughs> but these are important life lessons. So it's known that he's he's in control of it. He's responsible for it. He decides what he's doing with it. And I think that's quite empowering. And then it is learning those little mistakes. And better to learn that mistake giving Roblox 99p than waiting till you're older and it being much larger sums involved. Yeah, definitely. I would certainly agree. I think it's that saving versus impulse spending, isn't it? And I think with children, money burns a hole in there. So I think it, it, it does teach them those lessons early. And I think the opening the first bank account is important. It's a milestone for the child, but also gives them that vehicle to save and spend alongside it but, it but it's there and generally it stays with them for life so my current account if i share this with you i opened when i was 10. Oh. it's a very old bank account now but it, it's one of those ones that stayed with me and it's not necessarily that i stayed there because of that it's just i actually looked the other day i think on my credit score and it said how many years it had been open and that was quite scary really i think my first bank doesn't actually exist anymore oh, really i was alliance in leicester which was a building society. Yeah. Santander now. Yeah. Is that who it is now, right? Yeah. It's a milestone in the children. I think you remember, don't you? As a child, you remember who your first bank account was with. So I think that's really covers younger children, doesn't it? I think there's, there's only so much they can. But I think then we move on to teenagers or later teenagers. So I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. Have you got any thoughts, so, Jennifer? Because that's... you're closer to that age than I am. <laughs> I still feel very far away from it. <laughs> I find that an incredibly influential age and because we'll find a lot of people that then come to us to maybe look at buying a house and they're maybe 19 or 20 and in that one year that they've been able to have credit they've completely destroyed it so we want to do something more with financial education for it and I've been talking to some local schools to see if I can go in and do things like that in their kind of PSE classes because if they can get their kind of mindset right with their money and understand the power and also the limitations that it brings, then I think it can can help get them out of a bit of kind of financial poverty in the future. So the more that they know of that at that kind of age, the better. But it's just, it's really lacking. I think, wow, that's, that's a big one, isn't it? And it never occurred to me, 18, you can get credit. Well, yeah, so we'll see people with, I've, I've had people that have been, you know, in very early 20s that have been bankrupt. And you kind of think that that should be your last, absolute last resort, whereas they look at it going, well, it's fine because after a few years it will fall off and everything's better. And it's not actually the case, particularly with the bankruptcy. Um, so the better education they can for your credit card doesn't actually, whereas they see it as free money. Yeah, I find that quite a, a scary thing, like you say, that you do so much damage in that short amount of time. So the education is key, isn't it? And I think you know, anything that we can do, as you said, Jennifer, for contacting schools or guiding our own children, that damage stays with you for a number of years, doesn't it? And then it can make people quite afraid to have money in the future. And it can completely change how they how they treat debt and it almost becomes this fear. Whereas debt doesn't need to be this really fearful thing. It's not as if having credit card debt is the devil. It's just how you manage it. And if it's you know suitable for your life and it's still affordable, then that's fine. So you either get people who then had really bad debt and then are just completely terrified of adding to it out with the mortgage. Mm. So I think any sort of skills that we can sort of pass on, you know, older teenagers to, to avoid those pitfalls, I think is the better thing. And it comes back to credit cards, debit cards, bank accounts, any kind of buy now, pay later, all the sort of things where you're paying in installments. Actually, what do they do? to your credit rating. And I think that that's probably one of the ones that comes into the early 20s is what is your credit score and how does it work? That obviously is something that carries on through all the decades, isn't it, I think. In terms of late teenagers, is there anything else that, that you could think of, Julie, that might come in? No, I think that was just an eye-opener of what Jennifer said. But it's not just that you get people that are going to be scared of debt. It's then the, the flip side of that is you're potentially setting up a pattern for decades that you just live in a debt cycle, you get it cleared, you get more debt, you get it cleared, you get more debt. And because that's been your norm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, I just thought that was a really good point. 
and I think the other the other sort of side of that leading into your twenties is starting to budget. You know, if you're you're then working and how you budget that money. So presumably, Jennifer, when you've got people coming to you, they have to budget because they're then, you know, getting a mortgage and the affordability comes into it. There'll be others that live at home. Oh, yes, I'd say a lot of them do live at home. And so see if they're living at home and we see that they're in their overdraft and they can't save. Like, by all means, a lot of lenders will still look at that and go, that's fine. But I'll challenge them to go, right, if your mortgage is going to be £800 plus your council tax and your bills, you might be £1,200 a month that you need to spend more than what you're doing just now. So do that for the next three to six months and see how you feel and see if they hate it, then they're not ready to buy that level of house. But at least that way they've had the experience because see if you've bought the house, you're a bit stuck. I love that. That's a great tip. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's a great idea. Well, it means that it gets them comfortable because see if they're doing it and same with people who are upsizing as well, I'll tell them the same thing because if they're looking at that house that's maybe £200,000 more, if they're really not comfortable, particularly at a higher interest rate, then don't do it. Like, what's it actually achieving? I'll learn a lot of stress and a lot of worry. It's not, not normally what most people want. That's really, really important. And as you say, the upsizing, I wouldn't have thought of it for that either because you're already a homeowner, so generally you wouldn't consider having that dry run because you've already got a mortgage, it's not a, a big new thing. But I think with increasing interest rates, that's probably more and more of a consideration for many of your clients, Jennifer. Oh, absolutely. Because if you look at the changes of people going off one point something onto five point something, that in itself is a big jump. But if you're taking that from someone whose mortgage is maybe 100,000 and comparing it to someone whose mortgage is 400,000, a huge increase in what they're having to spend each month. And most people don't have that or they don't think of having that set aside and that they might need to spend it in that way so no I'd always recommend the turn one all right top Loving. tip so in your sort of 20s and so we'll move more on into your fuller 20s so shall I read some of the things off of the infographic and you can either sort of laugh or yeah go on <laughs> okay. I have my giggle at the ready so first one is live, learn to live below your means you know what if somebody had suggested to me in my 20s and sat me down and explained what that meant, it might have been more achievable. But I'm going to hold my hand up and say, I don't think I learned that till I was in my 30s. So if really someone <laughs> if someone had talked to me about what it really means and how you do it, I'm not saying I would have done it. I would have failed less than I did fail, if that makes sense. Totally agree with that. So the next one probably feeds into that, which is becoming financially independent. I think it's quite a tall order in your 20s. You see, I, yeah, I think, think so. I don't see my first reaction to that is, oh, for crying out loud, get over yourself. That's never happening. Because I think <laughs> we associate financial independence with the whole fire movement now, don't we? But I think maybe another way to look at it is it's the first time you're moving out of home from your parents' house. And so you're now suddenly responsible for bills and doing your own food shop and things like that. So I don't know if maybe that's what it means rather than what financial independence has come to mean, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think you're, and I think that feeds into, you know, Jennifer's having a trial run, but it's, I think the financially independent. So I will have a conversation with my, eldest daughter who says I'm going to move out and I'll be financially independent mom but if you could just help me out with this this and this and you go okay can I get so, yeah, all I excited they're... about some of the ones in your 20s right because I've just seen some of the ones in the 20s I did do one of them oh go on which one you do you all want to try and guess which one I had sorted out in my 20s right we all know it's not an emergency fund <laughs> develop a retirement plan Oh, God, no. <laughs> You're about 20 years early for that. I did take out health insurance. So I had income protection and life cover while I was in my 20s. I didn't have critical illness, but I did protect my income. Yeah, I have both as well in my 20s. All yeah, right. Same. Oh, we're all scoring really well on that one. <laughs> <laughs> It might be our industry, though, rather than... True, we were on. given a head start. But isn't that interesting? It was just because we were exposed to the information and yeah. we acted on yeah. it. So what that tells us is when you're given the information at the right time, it increases your chances of success. So I've given away one of the other ones that you're meant to have in your 20s, then it's this emergency fund. 
So who started their emergency fund in their 20s? I would say I had one, and then now I don't have one. So I'm working on getting it back again. What was the emergency, Jennifer? What was it? We needed a boiler and to get a rewire. All right. When it was done for the, for the emergency purpose, it wasn't, you know, sort of a holiday or... No, I'm probably a little bit towards the wedding. I don't think it was all boiler and all rewire. You know, I think the emergency fund is is nice to have, and I know it's something we would always recommend our clients have money put away for emergencies. But I think, as you say, in my twenties, it was probably not. No, I was just stupid yeah. and having too much fun. So, but anybody listening to this is thinking, okay, today's the day where I'm going to try and sort this whole emergency fund thing out. I'm going to start. You need episode twenty eight which is your guide to why everything you've been told about emergency funds is wrong and a different way to go about doing it. So we've already done a little episode to help you out if you feel the need to, right, this is the one I'm going to tick off today. So learn your credit score. Now, who in their 20s knew what their credit score was? So Jennifer, you are star pupil at the moment. Well, probably because I'm quite sad. I'd, but I absolutely knew my credit score, had the experience, paid for it all, even though I didn't need it prior to a mortgage. But no, I absolutely looked at it and I felt I always kind of looked after it. Whereas we all tend to find that most people, they either come in going, my credit score is 999 and it actually doesn't matter. And a lot of the time we can find that their credit reports are actually quite inaccurate. So they make them with this perfect 999 score, but it's not picking up on a lot of things that it should be. So credit score is important, but I wouldn't say it's as important as what people tend to think it is. Interesting to know, actually. So again, referring to my daughter, you know, she's like, I need to get a credit card, I've got to build my credit score, it's got to be amazing, it's got to be this. So it is about knowing what it is, what it does, and actually what effect it does or doesn't have on what you want to do, isn't it, I think? Yeah, I think if they're getting credit cards or anything like that, that do help in the background to build, so long as they're kind of paying it off and keeping within kind of under 50% of what the utilisation is, then those sorts of things are important. Whereas we've seen people think that they really need to build a credit, their credit because they've been told they need to build their credit and they get a payday loan, which is the complete opposite. Whereas in their head, they're completely doing what was right and they're doing something that's got credit, but they're just doing it in the really wrong way. And can I just jump in with something on credit scores as well? Because... Yes, it's important. But Jennifer, you obviously know a lot more about this than I do. I'm going to put it out there that some of it is nonsense. <laughs> okay, so, because I do actually check my credit score now on a regular basis. Not happening in my 20s or 30s. I'm going to own up to that one. So I dropped some points. <laughs> I think I dropped about 15 points. The reason I dropped 15 points, because I cleared my credit card. Yeah. I've used it for a big purchase. And then the next month I cleared it, credit score would plummet. And they all look very different and banks look at them in very different ways. So some of them favour one report over another and then a completely different report will actually show up a lot of kind of negative credit in the background. But yeah, you'll get some people who are really, really low and it's because they've actually just not updated their address to where they are now. It's maybe at their parents and it's a bit disjointed. So whenever they do update it, it maybe jumps up to 100 points. Whereas in their head, they're looking at it going, I've got really bad credit. What have I done? I need to try and do something to improve it. And we look at it going, change your address. You'll be, you'll be fine. Yeah, I signed up to, again, not in my 20s or 30s, but probably more recently. I think, is it, is it Credit Karma? So they sort of show you your credit score, but then it gives you steps you can do to improve your credit. They call it smart steps, I think. But I had a similar experience, usually, that suddenly my credit score dropped, and then I had a bit of an internal panic. Of, what have I done? What happened? And then you go on, and actually, it was something I'd done that was positive, but clearly impacted it in a negative way. And I think I opened a, a bank account to go on holiday last year for foreign money, but that also made it fall. because Two I accounts in a account. six month period, Credit Karma doesn't like it. Okay. And it's only when you start reading, isn't it? So I guess things like Credit Karma can help if you're new on that journey because it helps to guide you through. But I would also say to anyone listening, don't panic if it drops. It's not necessarily that you've done something bad. It could just be that the criteria to who you're looking at that's how they score it. So back to the twenties, and so I'm going to go back to one that I did mention earlier when I said I thought this is what Julie may have done. Develop a retirement plan in your twenties. What do we think about that, maybe? Who the heck has a retirement plan in their twenties? I did open a pension, a personal pension, my when I was I in nineteen. Want... 
I wonder if this is American language. If by saying develop a retirement plan, they mean open a pension. Because I think a lot of us can box that one off because you're generally going to get auto enrolled into something now and boom, you've got a retirement plan or a retirement account. It's not necessarily a plan. I think that was quite an easy one for people to achieve nowadays in their 20s. Am I wrong? No, no, I would agree with you because it's an automatic thing. I think when I was in my 20s, it wasn't an automatic thing. I'd seen things in the bank and that's why I went and did it along with the protection and all the other bits. But it is an automatic thing now and I think it's important that that's happening, but also maybe thinking about if you do have extra money putting it in. But I can imagine most 20-year-olds that I would speak to would rather keep that money. But obviously in our jobs, our view is to say, if you have, you know, put it in then add some more contribution to that. But I certainly did not have a retirement plan and I don't know any 20-year-old with I a... was in a pension in my 20s. Yeah. And yeah, I also pension. did additional savings into my pension in my 20s. I just remembered this. So you were doing your retirement plan. <laughs> it's not kind of the retirement plan, I suppose, that we would be looking at in our 40s, 50s and 60s. No, and in fairness, you need to remember that I started as a financial advisor when I was about 25. So that's how I'm taking so many of the 20 ones. Because you were, you were taking your own advice. I was. <laughs> yeah. I think when I sort of had a look earlier, I was trying to find other bits that would go with it. And I think the one thing was that when you buy things, again, this goes back to the credit and, uh, and debt, really, that you can afford all the bits that come with it. So if you want to buy a new car and it looks all lovely, you've got to remember all the other bits that you have to pay for mm. along with that, which all goes back to the... You know, keeping your debt down as much as you can, really. So, ladies, should we move into the 30s? Okay, right, Jennifer, you're on the spot now. Okay, this is your decade. <laughs> I've seen this list. How many of this list have you done before I read, start reading them out? A couple. But, yeah, only a couple. Okay, so do you have one times your salary saved for retirement? Absolutely not. I thought you were going to say absolutely then. <laughs> I have to say, I didn't have this in my 30s. Were you a good girl, Julie? Or... No, I did not have that in my 30s. My priorities were elsewhere at that time, and I'd also had two children by the time I was 30, so I think priorities were slightly... I was partying every weekend. That was my excuse. <laughs> Six, this. and then I had a child, so I, I slowed down. <laughs> so I obviously missed out on that bit then. <laughs> so in terms of the other one, so the other one is creates a will. Mm. Yes, so... got a will in place. Are you asking me if I've got one? I have got one. I'm trying to remember what age I was when I did it. Right, if we still lived on the Wirral. I think I've just managed that one in my 30s. I think it was about 38 or 39 when I did that. Oh, so you got a tick on that one. So you're, you're both very good on that one. I did have one in my 30s. So that was, so we're all good on that one. So well, this one is clearly very American. Start saving for your kids' college funds. Well, shall we UKify that, <clears throat> if that's a real thing? So I think yeah, generally a lot of people... Because it would, is a thing. People, when they have kids, lots of them do start saving and investing for them straight mm -hmm. away. And we should know, because we get loads of messages from them all the time, which is why we did a whole episode on it. So should we just call it start saving for kids? That's assuming that you're having kids in your 30s. Some people have them in their 20s and their 40s now. I don't know, not everybody has children. I guess it's a very personal thing, doesn't it? Yeah. And I, but but I think it a, goes back to saving, doesn't it? I, it'd be a no for that one because I don't have children, but I do have lots of nieces and nephews. So for mine, they all have a little savings account so that I put into oh. every month. And then for like Halloween or Easter, because I've got two of them that live in Germany, I'll put more into it so that whenever they're 18, if they you know, want to go on a gap year or if they do need anything, then at least I've got a little bit kind of set aside. I want to be adopted by your family, Jennifer. I want you to save for me for, at Halloween as there's, well. There's too many on my side, though. Like, there's <laughs> six. And I'm like, you just need to stop. <laughs> what else are we meant to have boxed off in our 30s then, Michelle? So increase your emergency fund. <laughs> You're both doing that laugh thinking again, aren't you? <laughs> so I think a lot of this is geared around savings, isn't it? So another one is start saving for a deposit on a house. So. Mm. You may have a lot of people who've done that in their 20s. Yeah. I think 
you find a lot of people that's an aim, isn't it? Once they sort of start working. So my gist from this is a lot of it is about saving and putting it into pots. We have different saving pots for different things, which mean doesn't necessarily have to be the ones listed here. As you said, Julie, it's very personal. It's what suits you and your lifestyle, what you want to save money for and towards it be that you have holidays or you have Jennifer with you with your sort of nieces and nephews. You've got things that mean a lot to you. And I think the only other one we haven't covered off is pay off non-mortgage debt. Now, I think in your 30s, my experience with clients is that quite difficult because you have so many family commitments building your career and you've still got a generally a sizable mortgage so I, what are your thoughts on that ladies I my experience is it's quite difficult okay so it was paying off non-mortgage debt wasn't it and mm. I do think that this is a coaching mindset type issue because if you think about how careers generally progress so in your 20s you start on not very much money and then by the time you hit your 30s, maybe your earnings a little bit better and you're accumulating stuff and you have the spending power to be able to service debt. And therefore you take debt on, whereas maybe you didn't have the spending power to be able to service debt as much in your 20s. So I wouldn't be surprised if people spend their 30s accumulating debt rather than deaccumulating debt. And I think that's just to do with how we think about things. And I think it's maybe going back to what Jennifer was saying to the teenagers to talk to them about credit and debt. Because if we've been brought up with the expectation, well, you can get a loan and you can go get a fancy car. Or you can use credit card to pay for the holiday. Whereas if we change the lesson that we had there with, okay, if you want that, if you start saving now, you can have that in three years' time. Whereas I think maybe a lot of people have got the mindset, I want a new car and I'll spend the next three years paying for it. Yeah. So it's it's an immediate need. You've got you've satisfied the immediate need and then you're paying for it afterwards, aren't you? Rather than the other way. Mm. I would agree with you that yes, I think 30s is people do accumulate debt. I think <laughs> most households do. And particularly at the moment, I think that is something people are doing to get through day by day. And yeah, and I think a lot more about it. What I would say as well is like, obviously, we're sitting here and we're laughing at how many of these milestones we've missed. But what I would say is, if you're listening to this, and you're thinking, I haven't got any of this, then look at us, right? We are financial professionals, and we missed a load of the milestones. And we turned out all right. So just because you're missing some of them, or you're feeling like you're lagging a little bit behind, it's not the end of the world, you can make it up, it will be okay. Just keep listening to us, we'll keep you right. Definitely. You know, and I think well, we're gonna go on to sort of the forties in a minute, but I think that's where you start to undo some of those, you know, wrongs that you, you maybe haven't been able to cover before due to circumstances, because it's personal to everybody, isn't it? So going back to Julie's sort of thoughts at the beginning that your forties is when things really start to hit home. We'll move into forties. So Interestingly, one of them on this list is review your financial plan and engage a financial advisor. Okay, so calling all 40-somethings, calling all 40-somethings, <laughs> you now need to get in touch with us. It's not enough just to listen to <laughs> us anymore. You actually have to speak to one of us. The infographic said so. So what are your thoughts on that? My experience with clients are... You, I have a fair few in their 40s, but I would say most of them are in their 50s. I would say my experience is that typically up until about four or five years ago, most new clients came to me were people in their 50s that had gone through that opening of the pension statement thinking, oh, shit, that's episode, whatever it is, it'll come back to me. But your 40s would be an ideal time to come and start talking to one of us. I think people are running about 10 years behind and they do tend to come to us in their 50s. But if you come to us 10 years earlier, I think it could make a tremendous difference. So I'm down with that one. I like that one. <laughs> yeah, I think that the earlier you can plan for things, the easier your transition is as you get into your later days. Jennifer, I wonder what your thoughts on this one are. So evaluate your household budget in your 40s. Oh, I think you should do it long before that. Something we do with all of our clients kind of any time they come back because a lot changes. So 
people that are honestly your childcare costs have went up or down because you know your thirties and your forties can be like the most expensive time of your life, particularly if you've got childcare costs. So we would always say you want to evaluate your household budget because if you've got a little bit more that you can, you know, put into your mortgage or pay off debt or you know put into your retirement, then do it because if you never evaluate it, you're not going to do it. So if you're only doing that in your forties, you've missed a good fifteen years that you could have done it for. You've covered off some of the other points, as you sort of said about that, obviously, with surplus income, with what you could do. I think, well, I'm in my 40s and I've always evaluated my budget ongoing. Since I've had, had to have a budget, to be fair, <laughs> because you have to adapt your changing circumstances as you go forward. No, I think it's something that should be done all the time. I'm just trying to think in context of the person that wrote this, what they were maybe thinking. I think it maybe is a little bit older than it first appears. Because if you think in your 40s, maybe at that point in time, children are starting to leave home. And the cost, because they cost money. (laughs) I think maybe in olden times, they used to leave home and not cost you any money. Because they don't have enough to buy their own house anymore. They're still with us. So maybe that would have been a sensible time to reevaluate your budget from the large changes that you might see in your life. Because you do traditionally maybe have children leaving home. That's maybe when you get the big pay rise or your career really progresses or things like that. Or it may be when you get divorced. So I think a lot of big life events can maybe happen in your 40s. But checking your household budget all the time, all along the way. If you rewind me back to my 20s and tell me to get a budget, that would be even better. Episode 26, budgeting, let's stop pretending there's a holy grail. So interesting, what you were just saying, in your 40s, so it's not on the, the actual document we have, but it says that your 40s is your potential peak earnings period, which I think is probably true if you go on the basis that if you've had children and your children are sort of older you can put more emphasis on your career mm. but in, in, alongside that you then got the, the savings again that goes with that surplus income so apparently in your 40s you should have three times to your salary to save for all right hang on i need to go mark this one out <laughs> i've still got time See, i haven't got three I... times i haven't i'm under no, i haven't either no so again, anyone listening, we haven't quite made that criteria. That doesn't mean it's it's wrong. It just means that, you know, maybe in the future you sort of look and do what you can to build your retirement fund up with the income. I'm debating whether to say something totally outrageous here. Oh, go on. We do okay, like Okay, all right. Having three times your salary saved for retirement, I'm going to put it out there that that's bullshit. <laughs> okay, I'm coming down off that fence. And if you listen to the previous episode with Ruth Sturkey talking about financial well-being, it's like, it's about what do you want from life? Because I'm sure I've told this story before, right? I'm up at a client's house, having listened to a podcast and arrived and announced I didn't want to be a shit financial advisor. The reason I didn't want to be a shit financial advisor was just having people shoveling money into their pension without knowing what they wanted back out of it or when because the money would have ended up arriving at the wrong time for what that client actually wanted so that would have made a shit financial advice so that's why use these as as milestone metrics right but don't get totally hung up on them because that might be what the bog standard average person should be aiming for but i rather suspect because you're listening to us there's nothing average about you you know in terms of you know we were talking earlier it is personal to you. What's good for one person is not necessarily good for the other. I think that's with social media, you have to be very careful with some of the things you read and take on board because we're not all the same. So is there anything else in the 40s that you would like to cover off apart from the fact that you have that pocket moment at age 40? It all starts to get very real. <laughs> I said to you at the beginning before we started recording. So I am 45 and I have now put together my folder which says when I am gone which for me was well-being because it means I know that the people around me know where to go find everything they need but it was a burning desire that seems to have grown over the last sort of four or five years that I need to have that done so I actually feel quite peace <laughs> I, can oh, move on. <laughs> I thought you were going to say so now I can die <laughs> so why do I need to know that I don't need to look at it just need to know it's there 
that's all I want. You. So presuming you get past the sort of the age 45 and you move on, we're now in the 50s. So I don't know if one of you two ladies would like to pick out something. It's got one of these other milestones here about now you should have five times your salary saved for retirement. I shared something with Jennifer when we were talking earlier on today. For anybody else that's listening, because I know that I'm not the only person that's like this. I didn't take my pension seriously until I got into my 40s. I pretty much ignored it because I did think I was going to be a teacher, which comes with a really good pension. Then I realized I couldn't possibly do that job for a living. I forgot that being a teacher was my retirement plan. So then I eventually started paying attention again in my 40s. And I am now on track to be fine. I can retire at 62. So how have I just started my 40s and I can go at 62? And I'm going to give you my top tip here. It's the 10%. So start saving or putting into your pension, whatever you can afford right now. And every year I have a rule, it has to go up by 10%. And I have to stick to that religiously. And if it turns out that I'm struggling one year, something else has to go because that's a non-negotiable. And it's that 10% thing, no matter what you start with today, if you can increase it by 10% each year, you're going to be okay. I love that. That's amazing advice. I think, you know, that's one of the things that, it is a non-negotiable, but it does show that even if you haven't done these things earlier, you can now make up the difference, so to speak. That's my worry is lots of people will look at it and go, I've left it too late. Oh, what's the point? So there is a point. You can still achieve everything. Yeah, and, and it's never too late. No. There are all these things that you can do to move your objectives as to when you'd like to retire and still keep on track. Even if it's not being a teacher in your retirement. What could you imagine? <laughs> I think you'd be a fantastic teacher. Yeah, with my language. Teacher. <laughs> I want to ask Jennifer about one of these, actually, that this one of these milestones you're meant to hit in your 50s. And it's about putting in context of, you know, the circumstances that we live in today. So one of the milestones, apparently, is that you're meant to pay off your house. And obviously, we've got you in now as our mortgage expert. And it blew my mind when I found out that you got mortgage terms that were longer than 25 years. And just the fact that people are now buying property much later in life because of the size of the deposit they have to save. How realistic is it for your average person to pay the house off in their 50s? Incredibly unrealistic. And I think to have it on the list will just make people compare themselves to others for it. And the vast majority of people's mortgages go until either whenever they thought they were going to retire and they're kind of mid 60s or up to 70. Some banks will take you much later. And if you've got your own company, they might even take you into your 80s. So most people don't pay off their margin in their 50s. I think they may be used to, but with deposits being bigger, with houses being more expensive and then buying significantly later, they don't tend to have the kind of financial availability to do that at that point in time. So what is the longest term you can get on a mortgage? It depends on what age you are, but some banks would take you for a 40-year term. If I was taking all my boxes in my 20s and let's say in sort of 30, I'm like, okay, I can do this. I can get a mortgage now. So I could early 30s get a 40 year mortgage term. Yeah, pretty much. Almost. Yeah. So uh, the vast majority, I would say, are over 30 or 35 now. It's the whole people used to think it was 25 and it comes back to that. Well, why? Why do you think that? Is it because your parents had that? Whereas if most people do it at that point, they put themselves under a significant amount of financial pressure. Whereas for your mortgage, yeah, a lot of them do take it out over that 30, 35, sometimes the 40 years. And what we'll do is every time we do their remortgage, we'll challenge them and go, right, you've had a promotion in that time or you've got rid of a car. So do you want to allocate a bit more of that money to this every month and we'll bring the term down? But terms are relative because the vast majority of people who are buying a house don't stay in that house. So you might have it for 40 years, but you're probably not keeping that house for 40 years. Hmm. I think what's really important about what you've just brought up there is challenging these generational ideas that we've got. We will have inherited beliefs about how your money should work. And so me, it was very deeply rooted in my head that you get a mortgage and it's no more than 25 years, less if you can, that's the norm. And the, clearly that is me very out of sync with the world today. And I think it's just being aware when you're looking at all these milestones for yourself is, is that really an appropriate milestone for you? Or is that something that you've seen someone else do or a family member? Just because someone else did it doesn't mean it's what's right for you. Yeah, that's my take on mortgages. All right, what else have we got in our 50s? Okay, so in our 50s, we're meant to have paid off our house. We're meant to have five times our salary. 
Oh my God, holy, c- oh God, I've just looked on the list, people. Do you know what's on the list that you're meant to be considering in your 50s? It's a thing called annuities. You don't normally touch them until you're in your 70s, do you? So if you don't know what an annuity is, it's where you save all your money into your pension, got a big pot of money, you hand it over to your insurance company, wave goodbye to your pot of money, it's gone. And the insurance company promises to pay you an income for the rest of your life. It's that income that's the annuity. Would you be looking at that in your 50s? No, I think I think we can say that they got that one wrong. I don't think we have a problem with coming right out and saying that, do we? Definitely not, because I think if someone in their 50s came to me and said, I'd like to look at annuities, we'd have exactly the conversation we've just had. I'd be like, go away and come back and see me in 20 years. I think that also goes for the other one that's on the list for 50s as well, is to look into long-term care insurance. I think we can safely say this is an American thing, because obviously our health service is far superior. So I think the other one I did pick up on 50s, which isn't on this list, is obviously a very good dish, which was the state pension forecast. Ah, that's a good show, actually, because I was going to pop that in. I saw it in the 60s, but no, that's a good show. Actually, I put that in the 40s as well. It's something that we encourage all our clients to do ongoing. But I think if you haven't done it, <laughs> 50s is the time to do it. Because if you do have any gaps, it's important that you've got time to make those up. To allow all right. You to get the full Shall we tell them how to check the state pension forecast? Yes. Shall I tell them how to check the state pension yes. forecast? <laughs> Okay, there are two ways you can check this. So the first one is you could just go and type state pension forecast into Google and it'll take you through into the government gateway. So if you've got your ID, you can log in and it'll give you all the information there. And it'll give you two numbers, I think. It'll tell you what you're forecasted to have and then what the maximum is that you can have. And it'll tell you if you've got any missing years. So you need to have 35 years to get the full state pension. And it'll tell you if you've got any missing years and you can go and buy them back. The reasons why you might have missing years, let's say you were out the country working or if you're my age, you might have been contracted out of service at some point. So there's lots of reasons why you might miss a couple of years. It's a good idea to just dip in every now and again, make sure that you're on track for your full 35. If you don't like the government gateway ID and all that nonsense, fair enough, not everybody does. Instead of when you go into Google, you want to type in B for Bravo, R for Romeo, 19, BR19. And the first result is going to be a PDF document, I think. You just click on that, you fill it in, and you send it off to them, and they will write back to you your state pension forecast. And also, I think on the government gateway as well, you can go in and see your history, can't you? So you can actually see the years that you've missed, which I found strangely interesting. I'm not sure if I'm the only person about that, but I thought that was quite fascinating. Um, got to hold my hand up, I did it too. <laughs> see, it must be something to do with the financial service industry, the things that we find exciting. <laughs> we need to get out more, don't we? Not in our 30s and we can't go to the pub every weekend like Jennifer can. <laughs> well, you can if you've got like four or five times. That means that Julie and I can't. <laughs> it's a bit like when you've not done your homework when you're little and you're asking your mum, can you go out to play? And she's like, have you done your homework? No, then you can't go out to play. So we need to work on that, Julie, so we can go out to play. Okay. <laughs> All or, right. Have... Or we just go out to play anyway. Let's just go out to um, play anyway. So, is there anything else that you ladies would sort of think about is important to consider in the fifties? Yeah, I, think... I would say for your house, if you want to be in longer term, because some people look at that whenever they get into their sixties or seventies, but by that point, you end up moving into something that doesn't actually feel like your home. Whereas, if you can downsize, it's a good idea to start looking at it while you've got the financial means to do it and to enjoy it. I think as well, in your 50s, there's different dynamics at play in your 50s. Because I'm I'm 48 and I've got an 11-year-old. So when I get into my 50s, I'm still going to have a dependent child. But I've also got a mum who's 75. And so it's in this decade that you potentially have the generation above you and the generation below you that need you. 
And that's definitely going to impact the life choices that you make. It may be you're choosing that you want to live somewhere differently. It may be that you need to cut down your hours for whatever reason. But I think that's why I think they've probably thrown in that they didn't throw in reevaluate your budget in your 50s. But I'm going to throw in reevaluate your budget in your 50s. And that comes into sort of every decade. But again, you should be adding it in because life changes, the priorities change and you know, all our circumstances change. So when I'm in my 50s, I'll have two hopefully financially independent children, but we shall see. I'm happy to share my financially dependent child if anybody wants to go. He's terribly well behaved and he's actually quite good with money. You see, he's had a good teacher, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. I think he's just smart. <laughs> right, have we boxed off the 50s? Then, so that moves on to 60s. So a lot happens. So I'm thinking state pension comes in in your 60s and that's what everyone sort of banks on in the 60s and that's what all the planning is kind of made around. I don't know if you feel the same. Yeah. Now see in real life, not in infographic land or in America, in real life, I think the most common sort of milestone challenge thing that I see, and I know you're going to be the same, Michelle, is you've got this situation where you've worked all your life and you get to the point where you're like, I don't really want to do this all the time anymore. But the state pension doesn't kick in till 60 whatever. Your occupational schemes don't kick in till 60 whatever the heck. So you've got this gap between, say, 60 and let's just say 65 for argument's sake. And maybe this is what you should have been thinking about in your 40s and 50s is that's when they said go and meet a financial planner in your 40s because we're looking at the gap and it's having a plan for how do we finance that bit between when we want to start working full time and when all the actual pensions start to kick in so it's occurring then but we should have been thinking about it earlier perfect sense and it's a conversation that i have with many clients and i would say a vast amount of my work is based around bridging that gap, whether mm. that gap starts at 55 or that gap starts at 60. That gap is probably the most key part of any retirement plan because that's the bit where people want to go and do other stuff and enjoy their life but don't necessarily have the guaranteed income or the pension income to cover that at that point. I'm going to say something controversial again. Oh, go on then. Okay, so... Lots of our listeners, some of them are in their 20s. So by the time they get to their 60s, that's 40 years' time. How likely do we think it is that they will be retiring in their 60s? It's not. It's not happening. I hate yeah. to break this to you. It just won't be like that. And it's interesting because one of the other things that's on the infographic is it says look into part-time employment options. And I suspect that my views on this have been aired before on the podcast, all right? I don't think you're going to see retirement going forward the way it was sold in the brochure. And then who was it? There was somebody came out in the news the other week asking older people to come back to work. Did anybody else see that headline? No, I know. Is it being q have done it in the past? Right. No, some politician came out the other week calling for people to come out of retirement because obviously we have a problem with the workforce right now because of we are an aging population. And then we've had Brexit. We don't have enough people to do the job. So they're actually saying, would you mind popping back in? And it's one of the thing, these things that's saying here is looking for part time employment. And I would put it to the listeners that whenever retirement or slowing down happens to occur for you, whatever decade it is, is be mindful of what else you want to do with your time. Because that's the commodity that you have to spend now is time. So how can you spend that time and for it to be meaningful and to give you purpose? Or it may even be to be able to sustain you so that you have enough money. So maybe challenge this idea that one day I will finally stop working forever, full stop. Might not happen like that. I have with clients regularly. And actually, when you delve deeper and you're speaking to clients about retirement, many of them don't actually want to stop working completely because they don't know what they will do with their time. And they actually, they'd like to find a part job that fits in with their values, fits with things they enjoy. They haven't got the financial pressure of earning a certain salary, but they can now go and do the things that they wish they'd been able to do mm. years ago. 
and I, I'm finding that more and more with clients. And actually, I love the idea of that, if you get to the point where you go, actually, I can do what I want to do now. I don't have to earn X. I don't have to do this. I can go and do something with less responsibility, which I think is a thing for a lot of clients, and less pressure, less stress. And do the things that I, I quite like to do. Right. Now, I'm going to guess that you've got a few more things on your list for the 60s that didn't make it onto the infographic. Planning for an eventuality of long term care being required. And some of the planning needs to be done quite far in advance in order to make sure that one, you know how it would work and you know what would happen. And I think that's peace of mind for people to know that's there so I think that's come from my conversation with clients and it's very much that they've seen their parents health start to deteriorate at a certain point and they want to have everything in place for that eventuality I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that absolutely I do I think there was a phrase I thought you were going to use I thought you were going to tell everybody to go and do something episode 52 folks why you need a power of attorney (laughs) that was actually going through my head now, arguably, we could whiz back to whenever you made your will and make your power of attorney then, but definitely needs to be in place in your 60s because once you need it, you can't have it. And I think the other thing is obviously what 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 can happen is people will come and talk to us once they're in their 80s about, an inherit- about inheritance tax planning. And really... That's a bit of a challenge to fix once you're in your 80s. If you start talking to us about it in your 60s, it all becomes immensely more doable. In terms of power of attorney, I did have it on my list, but it wasn't for the person in their 60s. It was ensuring that your parents have power of attorney. Ah, okay. Oh, yeah. Because I think there's a generation of parents who didn't automatically have it in mm. place. Like we're quite good at telling clients now or you go to places that it's, it's out there. I think the generation above that don't necessarily always have that in place. That's a good show. And if, you, if you've got to look after your parents, you want to do it in line, in line with their wishes. So, so I did have it on there, but just not quite in the same context for that. So any other ideas for 60? Jennifer, Chris. what do you think you're going to be doing in like twice your lifetime's time? I don't know. I would either still be working for that. Yeah, I doubt the pension age will be anywhere you were beginning with the six. But I'd say hopefully by that point, have some of it sorted out and be able to go on holiday. I think whenever it gets to the point, whenever you're retiring, you need to start it with some fun things that you're going to look back on and always think that that's what you worked for. You worked for the things that you enjoy rather than just sitting going, I've got eight times my salary saved into my retirement. Can I just throw in as well is this idea, let's go with the idea rather than the decades of retiring or not working as much. And it's a, it's a mindset shift because you've just spent your entire life saving and paying off debt. And now we've got to the point where you're actually meant to spend the money. And I know a lot of people find that transition really hard. So it's just being aware that, that there's little shifts that will go on throughout life, but... I think that's quite a big one for people to adjust to. It's a huge adjustment, isn't it? Because you've spent all that time being disciplined and, and doing it, and then someone... And I think that's where you were talking about inheritance tax planning. You know, and you can do that. We started earlier in the 60s, and sometimes that looks like gifting to your family. Hmm. But it's amazing how hard people can find doing that because they've spent all those years building up that wealth and they may not necessarily have the faith or the trust in the person that they want to gift it. But on the flip side, they want to see them enjoy it. So it, it's a double-edged sword. It's quite a, another mindset to get through. I want to give these people that money, but I'm, I don't quite like trust them with it. So actually, I won't. I'll hold on to it for a bit longer. And then we end up with the scenario in your 80s, an inheritance tax them. There's another one I'm going to throw in, I think, actually. It's a conversation that I have quite a lot, and that is paying for care. I think this might be one of those things that how you feel about it changes over time. And once the prospect of it being a potential outcome raises its head, 
how we feel about it changes very much. So you maybe want to think about how important is it to you to be able to pay for your own care. And the conversations I have with clients is, they, to a certain extent, they're not that bothered about themselves, but it's thinking about family. If you're going into a home, it's thinking about the family that need to come and visit you there and what that's going to be like for the family as a whole. So I think that's a conversation I would encourage people to have. You say you'll see clients whose parents are going into there, and actually, as you say, it's what it looks like for them. They want to see that mum and dad are being looked after in a way that they would expect them to be. I've got other clients who speak about long term care, and they'll say, I, I don't care. I don't care where, I, as you say, I don't care where I go, but their children will. Mm. But that brings it back to what we've talked about in most podcasts is having conversations with your family early so not leaving it to your 60s 70s it's having it maybe in your 50s right. how that works right we just on a like a, a mad dash in the 20s 30s 40s and 50s and 60s we have and it ends at 60 so we don't go to 70 i know i noticed that so the infographic we're using it only stops at 60 so what I can tell you is the Women of Money Cafe, if we are still running in 20 years' time, we will be here and we will be reporting back to you on what the things you need to be bringing your 70s and 80s are. We may have raised the next generation of Women in Money Cafe podcast hosts by then. We'll be able to take you into, you know, the centenary. Who knows? All right. So I think, is there anything else that we need to cover, ladies, or that you wanted to add? I think just making sure that everyone knows that not everyone's journey is meant to be the same. So no matter what you read online, try not to compare yourself too much to it. I think that's absolutely spot on. Uh -huh. That would be my thoughts exactly. It's personal. It's your own journey. Yeah, so we've just given you a load of milestones. Like Write them all on a post-it note, throw them up all in the air and arrange them in the order that suits you. Yeah. I think yeah. the big ones we're all yeah. going to agree on. When you can, try and sort out that emergency fund. When you can, try and start saving into that pension. When you can, start trying to pay down the debt. Yeah. We just do it when we can. It's not a race, is it? No. No, and everyone's circumstances are different. So, Jennifer, that was a really nice last thought from you. Michelle's personal lesson tap. So, infographics, they're entertaining. By all means, keep reading them, but don't treat them like Bibles. But, so, I just want to say thanks, Michelle and Jennifer, for joining us and to you for listening. And until next time, take care. <laughs>